guess we better just dive right in. And uh, we are we ended yesterday in the middle of a topic. We were talking about finding some limits, and today we're going to keep finding some limits. So we ended yesterday talking about taking the limits of sums and differences. Um, that's addition and subtraction, if you haven't heard differences recently. So if you remember what those rules were, you probably Yes, let's see, just try to remember where parentheses go. If you remember the rules for addition and subtraction, you are not going to be shocked by the rules for multiplication. To find the limit of a product, We find the individual limits and multiply them together. And we, we're so limited at this point with the limits that we know how to take that we really can't do any great examples with this because the oatmeal but we can do something. I mean, whether it's great or not, I don't know. We can find the limit of x squared, for example, assuming that we remember that x squared is x times x. So what should the limit of x squared be as x approaches three? Nine. nine is what I hear, and nine is correct. We break the limit of the product up into two limits. And hopefully we remember from yesterday how to find the limit of x. We just take that c, we take the thing that x is pointing to and we plug it right in. And we get nine. Um, this isn't the most exciting example in the sense that we're now going to learn a different limit law that's directly designed to work with powers. So the limit as X approaches C of a function raised to a power is the limit of the function raised to the power. So we could have done x squared using this rule instead of the product rule, but but we needed an example for the product rule. Again, we're very limited at the moment. Um, pretty shortly, we'll learn how to take the limits of trigonometric functions, and then we'll have examples that aren't just x. But for now, the limit as x approaches 2 of x cubed is what? Eight. 
Be <laughs> born. <laughs> He's saying it. You just can't hear him. <laughs> hey, thank you. Yeah, my uh. Apologies if that happens. Always feel free to speak up. I guess I should explicitly say, if anybody was wondering, these things are, I mean, you might not even be able to see them under the hair. The ear things are off. I just wear them everywhere. Um, so, hey, thank you. And um, the textbook states this as being true if n is an integer. I mean, you can just think of this as being true in general. I mean, the, I guess, well, I guess the textbook says positive integer. And the textbook says positive integer because it is possible to find examples where this rule fails. So maybe I maybe I should make some kind of comment. This is true if that exists. And I mean, an example where things go south, the limit as x approaches zero of x to the negative first. And the reason this goes south is that x to the negative first is putting that x into the denominator. And at zero, we have a division by zero error. So, um, to use this rule, you need that right-hand thing to exist. And we'll see a very similar caveat. I thought the power was already off. Maybe it just was disconnected. Anyway, um, sorry, it was talking to me. Um, And what was I saying? I was saying that we'll see something very similar when we get to division, which we'll do in like five minutes. And I mean, I guess properly speaking, we have the similar kind of caveat when we talk about the limits of roots, but in practice, we don't run into problems taking limits of roots. In practice, when any of these rules break down, it's because we're dividing by zero. And the limit of a root At this point, you won't be surprised, perhaps, to see that it's the root of the limit. And again, the examples we can do are extremely limited. The limit as x approaches 4 of the square root of x is what? And I'm seeing 2 and 2 is correct. We take the limit inside and we wind up with 2. And I mean, again, we have, we have what are really minor caveats, but again, uh, to use this rule, you know, the right-hand side of that equality has to exist. 
what would be a situation where a square root doesn't exist? Negative one. Negative one. So if instead of four, I tried to take the square root as x approaches negative one, we wouldn't be able to use this rule. And in this particular case, not being able to use the rule means that the limit doesn't exist. Um, so assuming that, that the limit exists, we'll be able to find it using this rule. And that is not the case with the next rule. Um, we did multiplication, and you probably have expected that after multiplication comes um, division. Instead, we went on sort of a, a detour. We talked about powers and roots. The limit as x approaches c of f of x divided by g of x is again what we've probably uh, we've probably come to expect. I mean, if the limit of a sum is the sum of the limits, and the limit of a quote of a difference is the difference, and the limit of a product is a product, it might not be super surprising that the limit of a quotient is a quotient. But the limit of the quotient has a condition that needs to be satisfied. What would that condition be? What's a situation where this rule would break down? If the limit of g of x equals zero, thank you. We cannot divide by zero. So if this rule gives us a division by zero error, the rule fails. But, and this is, this is a really important statement, Even if the limit as x approaches c of g of x equals zero, the limit might still exist. And in fact, the main limit that we're going to look at in calculus one is an example of that. Um, Can you clarify the top as long as the limit of g of x equals zero or does not equal does zero? Does not. Okay. That was a pernicious typo. Thank you for catching it. Um, so a few days ago, was it Tuesday, probably, we looked at something like f of 3 minus or f of x it was, try to get these in the right order, minus f of 1 divided by x minus 1, and we took the limit as x approaches 1, or we tried to take the limit as x approaches 1. Um, we didn't have that terminology, of course, but we investigated it in our calculus. 
excavator. And I haven't erased anything out of my calculator, so I suppose it will still be there if, um, They changed the way the licensing works. It's very annoying. Aha, cool. So I'm not going to be allowed to use the calculator because I don't have the password to get through our firewall. Cool, cool. Okay, well, never mind. Not showing you this on the calculator after all. But we did look at this. We created a table of values as X approaches one. And if I'm remembering right, It looked as if the limit should be 20.2 from the table. And in this situation, we cannot use the quotient rule. If we tried to use the quotient rule, the rule we just put on the whiteboard, here's what would have happened? We'd have gotten a limit in the top. We'd have gotten a limit down below. We, properly speaking, um, the function f of x we were talking about, it was a quadratic. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and say that that this is what would have happened at the top. We would have ended up with a zero at the top. We can see using the rules we know that we'd have ended up with a zero down below. And we'd have wound up with a zero divided by zero. And then that would have, you know, okay. Um, zero divided by zero is not defined. It's not one. It's certainly not 20.2. The limit exists, even though this quotient rule breaks. And I'm going to, we're going to, I should say, Learn to find a few limits where the quotient rule fails. Um, I'm going to depart from the textbook just a little here. The textbook is really concerned about this, and I'm not. I think that there are things that are more important to do with the uh, limited time we have, then find a bunch of limits using a bunch of very specialized rules. But we'll see one or two by the end of this class. Using what we know, We can find the limit of any polynomial. Right. Let's go ahead and keep with the polynomial from Tuesday's example, which if my memory is serving me, was that polynomial. 
Um, this is on the previous frame. That's the limit we're now going to find. And we can find it just using the rules we've learned. And I mean, it's a slightly tedious exercise, but we've got stuff being added up. And if we've got stuff being added up, we can take that limit. We just look at the individual limits and add them. So we've got the limit as x approaches 1 of negative 4.9x squared, and the limit as x approaches 1 of 30x, and the limit as x approaches 1 of 1. And these individual limits we can find, um, made, I mean, with some work, but but we have a rule for when there's a constant in front of a function, and that's that's just what we see in two of those situations. That negative 4.9 is a constant in front of the x squared. That 30 is a constant in front of the x. And the rule we had said that we can take constants and pull them out, put them in front of the limit. So the limit as x approaches 1 of negative 4.9x squared is negative 4.9 times the limit of x squared. The limit of 30x is 30 times the limit. And... We don't need to use that rule for the last limit. The last limit is just the limit of one. Don't worry about it. Um, so we've got the limit of a power, and we've got a limit of x, and we've got a limit of a constant. And I wish I had a slightly more space, but we can take each of these limits. And because we don't have slightly more space, I'll make just one observation that we have the limit of x squared and that according to one of the rules we learned today, that's the limit of x squared. And now, the limit of x as x approaches a number is the number. So there's a negative 4.9 times one squared. There's 30 times 1, and there's the limit of a constant is a constant, so the limit of 1 is 1. And notice, yes, that's less out of the way up there than anywhere else. I mean, we, we can then go to, well, I can't go to my calculator, it's not working, but we could go to a calculator and plug that in. 
the observation I really wanted to make here is that if we call this polynomial f of x, then the limit as x approaches one is f of one. I know that I said when we take limits, we don't ask what happens at the number itself. But polynomials are a special kind of function whose limit is easy to find. In the special case of polynomials, if we want to know what happens as x approaches the number, we do just plug that number in. Uh, that's why going back a frame, going back a frame zoom, uh, maybe not going back, there we go, going back a frame. That's why I said, okay, we were taking the limit of this polynomial and the limit of the polynomial. Man, something critical is happening to, to this whiteboard. You can see me pressing down. You can see the draw icon is selected. It's like drawing itself. <laughs> okay. Terminator. Yeah, either a technological issue or possibly a haunting. Um, <laughs> the answer is one. There it is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it just spells 42. <laughs> yeah, it, it seems. Um, so what I'm going to, well, I said I was going to try leaving this room. It was very optimistic of me to assume that, that pressing the more button would cause anything to happen. Just let it finish drawing. Jeez. Yeah. Um, see if it does anything interesting. What I... <sighs> And it's gone. Okay, well, um, well, when I said I thought we'd be dismissing a little early today. I think there was a bug. Isn't there a bug up on the top? No, oh, like, oh, I see I, it. I think that was something. Oh, it's crazy. <laughs> Literally. Okay. Okay. You just watched it. Just go <laughs> yeah. Good. Uh. Good eye. So, um, I was saying the limit as x approaches one of f of x, and I was saying, well, we don't know how to find the limit of a quadratic, but it's going to turn out that it's f of one precisely what we now see on this frame. The limit of that quadratic is f of one. So I can write that down. Rule. If, let me use p of x for polynomial. If p of x is a polynomial, it is an exception to the statement I made that you can't find limits by looking at C. For polynomials, we can find limits by just plugging C in there. And um, it's going to actually turn out that a lot of functions 
facts act like this. Like, it's going to turn out that we can find the limits of trigonometric functions just by plugging the value in. Again, kind of the frustration of calculus is that we'll learn all of these really easy limits. It's easy to find the limit of a polynomial. It's easy to find the limit of a trig function. But the limits we actually care about are going to be precisely the limits where those rules fail. Um, but let's put another rule on the board. If R of X is a rational function, And R of C is defined the limit as X approaches C of R of X equals R of C. So Rational functions have the same property that polynomials have. They have the same property that I've said trig functions have, except that there's a caveat. Um, and that's that to use this rule, R of C has to exist. And I mean, just to make sure we're all on the same page here. A rational function is a polynomial divided by another polynomial. So the reason this rule works is that we've got division and let me write that a little higher up. We have a rule for division, which says that to take the limit of a quotient, We just look at the individual limits. And then because we find the individual limits, we find the limit of a polynomial by plugging C in there. We find the rational function by plugging C in there. And there is this caveat to use this rule, R of C is it needs to be defined. What that means in practice is that we can't have a division by zero error. And as a note, this limit might exist even when this rule fails. And again, we've seen an example where the limit exists even though the rule fails. And that example was what we did on um, Tuesday. Yeah. On Tuesday, we had the limit as x approaches 1 
negative 4.9 x squared plus 30x plus 1 minus, let's see, f of 1. 30 minus 4 is 26 minus 0.9 is 25.1. Uh, plus one. It's possible that, that my mental math is a little off, but we had the limit of a rational function, something that looked something like that. And we said, well, this, we looked at tables, and at least the table was sure suggested that that limit does exist, that it's 20.2. This is a rational function, but, um, but if you plug one in there, you get a division by zero error. So this limit, and I, I see now my, my mental math is wrong, but never mind. The, the takeaway message is that even though we can't use this rule, it doesn't mean the limit doesn't exist. It just means the rule doesn't work. And thanks to that bug, we're probably gonna use about the full time after all. Um, probably the only trick that I want to teach you is finding the limit of a rational function where the rule fails, because it's a quick and I won't say easy, but I will say straightforward rule. It's very easy to explain how it works. And let me just get a good example. The limit as x approaches one of x squared minus one divided by x minus one. So, this is a rational function. And the first thing we should do when we're faced with the limit of a rational function is plug one in and see what happens. Because assuming we don't get a division by zero error, rational functions have this property. Well, we do get a division by zero error. We get zero divided by zero. And zero divided by zero, again, that's not defined. It could be anything. If you're taking a limit and you get zero divided by zero, that's often a sign that the limit does exist, however. That's not an absolute rule. It's possible to find situations where you wind up with this and the limit does not exist. But this at least suggests the limit might exist. Any other division by zero error when you're working with rational functions would end the problem. But a zero over zero is telling us, keep going, keep thinking, we might be able to do something here. And the trick with rational functions is easy to put into words. It's to factor the things and cancel any like terms and see what happens.
x squared minus 1 factor. Yes, it's x minus 1 times x plus 1. And now that everything is factored, you see that it's possible to do cancellation. Those x minus ones go away. And that leaves us with the limit as x approaches one of a polynomial. Because this is a polynomial, we don't have to mess around with that list of eight or nine rules we have to find the limit of a polynomial. Let me just stick that number in for x. And we see that this limit exists and is 2. And, okay, if we do bear with me for just a moment while I get us to Desmos. Let's take a look at this. So we're looking at x squared minus one divided by x minus one. And we're looking at what happens as x approaches one. Let's make that a dotted line. So as our x values approach one, what happens to our y values? Well, here is two. It sure looks from this graph as if, as our x values approach 1, our y values approach 2, and that's exactly what we found via our cancellation. At 2 itself, at 1 itself, come on, the smokes, there we go. At 1 itself, there's just this pin print this tiny hole in the graph. And that's the kind of thing, if you see a zero divided by zero, that's generally happening. If we had just an X up in the top, now our rule fails. We can't plug one in because we get a division by zero error. And also the limit doesn't exist. It just goes up to infinity. And those are for, for my purposes, at least. Uh, I should go check the homework to make sure I don't ask you anything outrageous. But I, I think as far as limit finding tricks, I'm happy with this. There's another one that sort of gets taught a lot involving messing around with square roots. And it's kind of, this is never showing up in any problems or applications ever. So why is this something we've decided to, uh, to teach everyone? So I'm going to be the change I want to see in the world and not do that. And I think we are done. And I will see you I will not see you Monday. Monday is Memorial Day, is it? It's a day off in any event. Labor Day. Labor Day. Thank you. So I will see you Tuesday. Have a great long weekend.